I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land from which I'm speaking to you today, the Wurundjeri and Boon peoples of the Kulin Nation. I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the Central Victorian Goldfields region, including the Berenji Gajan, representing the Wachabalak, Jadwa, Jadawajali, Wagaya and Japagulf peoples, and the Jajawurrung, Eastern Ma, Tungurrung, Wadawurrung, Wandering Woiwurrung and Yorta Yorta peoples. Welcome to today's event, which the National Trust is ho hosting in partnership with the Central Victorian Goldfields World Heritage Bid for the Australian Heritage Festival. We have a lot to get through today. Please note that today's event is being recorded and will be available to view afterwards. After we've heard from our speakers, I will invite questions from the audience for our panelists. So please use the Q&A function or the chat on your screen to ask questions. Without further ado, I'm delighted to welcome our bid patrons, beginning with the Honourable John Brumby, AO. The Honourable John Brumby served for more than 10 years as Treasurer and then Premier of Victoria, six years as Leader of the Victorian Opposition, and seven years as Federal MHR for Bendigo during the period of the Hawke government. Since retiring from politics, Mr Brumby has accepted a number of appointments in both the business and not-for-profit sectors. He has a long history with the Central Victorian Goldfields World Heritage Bid, and in 2019, he joined the Honourable Dennis Knapfine as its co-patron. Thank you for joining us today, Mr. Brumby. Thank you very much, Felicity, and um, warm welcome to you, to the panellists, and to my co-patron, uh, Dennis Knapfine, uh, and to my and my welcome also to uh, all of the people who are online with us today. And can I also acknowledge the traditional owners of country and pay my respects to all elders past, present, and emerging. Uh, can I just say at the outset, it's, it's fabulous to be part of the Australian Heritage Festival. It's a great celebration uh, of the way that our heritage enriches our lives. And particular thanks then to the National Trust of Australia, Victoria, for your work on this very important event. And actually yesterday I was in the, the car listening to ABC radio and heard Simon Ambrose interviewed um, about this event today. So um, great to be part of it. Um, this panel session is an introduction to the Central Victorian Goldfields World Heritage Bid. You're going to hear in a moment, a few minutes time, from experts in uh, world heritage, in tourism, in archaeology, and from the bid team itself. Uh, for me, though, this is, um, this is personal, I think. Um, I've, been a, I've been a passionate supporter of world heritage listing for the Goldfields ever since I was the federal member for Bendigo more than 30 years ago. And we launched back then in the mid eighties with the late Professor Weston Bate, uh, our early bid to have the Goldfields um, listed at that time. More recently, of course, the region's 13 local governments have partnered to achieve this goal. The project is being led by, I guess what we could describe as two traditionally uh, rivalrous regional cities Ballarat and Greater Bendigo. And of course, as I said earlier, I've been delighted to formally join the bid with my co-patron, uh, former Victorian Premier Dennis Napstein. Uh, what brings us all together, I think, is our fierce pride in the Goldfields region and our determination to see it recognised for its unique historical, economic, social, cultural and technological significance. Uh, not just for Victoria, not just for Australia, but in fact for the world as a whole. We also know that World Heritage Listing, as well as the journey to achieve it, can help regional and community development, and it can support COVID-19 tourism recovery and jobs. In many ways, it, it could be a um, second, albeit smaller, gold rush for the region, and I think it couldn't come at a more needed time. Uh, when you think about the region's heritage, it's unquestionably among the best in the world. And it tells an important story about the world's social and economic development. For a period of about 50 years, from the mid 19th century to the turn of the 20th, the world went mad for gold. 
from Colorado to Canada, from South Africa to New Zealand, the tiniest glimpse of this yellow stuff could transform any rural backwater into a raging new metropolis as prospectors descended, literally from every corner of the globe, each hoping to strike it rich. And in just 50 years, more gold was mined across the planet than in the previous 3,000 years combined. But the most profound, long-lasting and transformative gold rush of the 19th century happened about 120 kilometers northwest of Melbourne in what is now known as the Central Victorian gold fields. Now, in order to achieve world heritage status, we have to show that the Central Victorian gold fields are what UNESCO calls outstanding universal value. I have no doubt that they are, but then I'm a proud long-term resident. Our bid team, with the help of Indigenous specialists, historians, archaeologists, and local and international universities, now has to prove it. So my message today, I'd like to encourage all residents um, to get involved, to keep informed, to get out and to appreciate our own rich heritage in the sites and the monuments of the Central Victorian gold fields. Can I say it's been an honour to be with you today um, and my co-patron Dennis Napfine and the expert panellists today, I wish you all the best for this important session. Thank you. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your, your thoughts and your insights having been involved for so long in this process. I would now like to welcome the Honourable Dennis Napthine, former Premier of Victoria, who has had a long and successful 27 year career as member of the Victorian pa Parliament, proudly representing Southwest Victoria. He served as Premier, as a Minister in three governments and as Opposition Leader. Among his key ministerial appointments, Dr Napthine served four years as the First Minister for Regional Cities which included Ballarat and Bendigo. Since retiring from politics, Dr. Napthine has continued to serve the community in a variety of roles. And in 2019, he joined the Honourable John Brumby as co-patron for the Central Victorian Goldfields World Heritage Bid. Thank you, Dr. Napthine. Uh, thank you, Felicity. And can I acknowledge uh, the Heritage Festival and the National Trust for the work that they do uh, not just for this festival, but throughout the year and for over many, many years. Can I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands of the Central Victorian Goldfields and acknowledge Elders past, present and emerging. And today I'm speaking to you from Western Victoria in the lands of the Gundich Mara people, people and I recognise their Elders past, present and emerging. I acknowledge the John Brumby, uh, the Honourable John Brumby AO, my co-patron and the many distinguished guests on the panel and in the audience today. During my time as Premier and my period, particularly as a local state member for Southwest Victoria, I was extremely proud to support the work of the Gundich Mara traditional owners and their bid to, unique, to list the unique Budge Bim cultural landscape on the World Heritage List. This successful listing in July 2019 and the process to undertake the listing had an enormous effect on this area and our whole region. Firstly, it has significantly changed our knowledge and understanding of Indigenous culture and history in Southwest Victoria. Secondly, the World Heritage Listing provided special and vital protection for this beautiful and unique landscape and cultural heritage well into the future. And thirdly, the bid and the listing. The bid itself and the listing uh, provided a really important way of putting this area on the map in terms of its cultural heritage and its landscape. And despite a brief interruption with the COVID pandemic, it has significantly boosted tourism, jobs and the local economy. And I say that because I feel exactly the same passion and enthusiasm for the Central Victorian Goldfields World Heritage Bid. I think that's how this bid is well worthwhile, as my co-patron John Brumby explained, in terms of the history, the culture, and the lasting impact of that gold rush period on our uh, economy, 
on our social development, on our understanding and development of the area. But it's also about the benefits that will deliver, both in the bid process and the ongoing benefits in terms of employment, jobs, tourism, and the revitalization, the continued revitalization of the region. And that's why I'm absolutely committed as a co-patron to helping deliver the World Heritage Listing for, for the Central Victorian Goldfields region. This region certainly does have a unique cultural heritage, which is worthy of World Heritage Listing. And I believe the focus it will bring will bring conservatively an extra $25 million a year in added tourism, increased investment into local infrastructure and services, greater protection of our unique cultural and heritage assets right across the central goldfields region, and most importantly, an increased community awareness and pride together with stronger regional partnerships. And the fact that 13 diverse councils are involved in this process are already seeing the benefits of that. So I think that this region will benefit significantly from not only World Heritage Listing, but very much from the process and getting involved. So I think there is a real opportunity that this process will make a significant and lasting difference to this region as a great recognition of what has happened in that gold fields, in that gold rush and the development since. So I would certainly join with my co-patch and John Brumby in urging people to take an interest in this process, to get involved in this process, because this is the process that will benefit this region, benefit the state, benefit Australia. And we're all involved in making sure that this bid is really successful, both in uh, encouraging and involving people in it and making sure we deliver positive outcomes now and well into the future. It's been my pleasure to be involved today and I look forward to continuing involvement with John Brumby as co-patron and delivering on this World Heritage Bid and all the benefits it will bring. Thank you so much, Dr. Napfein, for joining us today and also um, to your co-patron, the Honourable John Brumby AO. We really appreciate your time today. So now we will move to our panel discussion. And I would like to welcome our first panelist, Crystal Buckley AM. Crystal Buckley AM is a lecturer in cultural heritage at Deakin University and is the course director of Deakin's Cultural Heritage and Museum Studies program. Her research focuses on world heritage and international heritage practices, including the implementation of the UNESCO recommendation on the historic urban landscape and the integration of cultural and natural heritage. Ms. Buckley served as an international vice president of, of ICOMOS from 2005 to 2014, and now works as a world heritage advisor to ICOMOS. And for those who aren't familiar, ICOMOS, the International Council on Monuments and Sites, is one of the three formal advisory bodies to the World Heritage Committee. And in particular, they're responsible for the evaluation of all nominations of cultural and mixed properties to the World Heritage List against the basic criterion of outstanding universal value as specified in the World Heritage Convention. So thank you for joining us today, Crystal. So first of all, could you please provide an overview of the role and purpose of the World Heritage Convention and the steps that need to be taken to have a place included in the World Heritage List. Thank you, Felicity, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm speaking today from Wadawurrung country, and I acknowledge uh, the Wadawurrung people, their elders and ancestors, and of course, all the um, First Nations people uh, who may be listening in and who have country and culture in the areas that we're going to speak about, just echoing all the other acknowledgements that have been made. The, I have a few quite technical questions to answer today, so I'll be with uh, clarifications. So the World Heritage Convention was adopted by Member States of UNESCO in 1972. In many ways, it is a creature of its time. 
uh, its purposes are far greater than the tending of the famous World Heritage List. Signatories uh, such as Australia agree to research and care for their natural and cultural heritage, develop policies and programs and laws for those purposes, recognising the importance of heritage in the life of communities. These things are all stated in the convention text. But in relation to properties that are inscribed in the World Heritage List, the obligation is to sustain their OUV or outstanding universal value. This is a strange term, it's defined broadly as cultural and or natural significance which is so exceptional as to transcend national boundaries and to be of common importance for present and future generations of all humanity. As such, the, pre the permanent protection of this heritage is of the highest importance to the international community as a whole. So it sets a very high bar. In terms of the steps to inscription on the World Heritage List, which I think was part of your question, um, these are outlined quite clearly in the various um, documents that support the World Heritage List. But uh, the, the um, key milestones are several. The first is entry in the national tentative list. This is not a difficult requirement, but in Australia requires an alignment between state and Commonwealth governments, traditional owners and public and private property owners and management authorities. The Australian government currently considers inclusion in the national heritage list to be a precursor for the World Heritage Tentative List. The property must be included in the tentative list for at least one year before the nomination is submitted. And then all nominations must be submitted before the 1st of February each year. Late or incomplete nominations are not considered and need to wait another year. Once nominations are received and considered to be complete, they are forwarded for evaluation by one of two bodies or both, IUCN or the World Conservation Union for Natural Heritage and ICOMOS as Felicity has explained already for Cultural Heritage. And both of them look at the nominations for mixed proposals. The, the evaluation process takes a little over one year. Um, many things happen during this period. It's a busy time. ICOMOS will conduct desk reviews of the claim made for outstanding value and will send an evaluation mission to visit the nominated place. There are various exchanges between the nominating state party, Australia and ICOMOS during the evaluation and the ICOMOS World Heritage Panel will meet twice to determine the recommendation that will go for, to the World Heritage Committee. At one of these, the first of these panel meetings, uh, representatives of the country concerned will be invited in for a discussion of the key issues. An interim report is provided around Christmas time in the cycle, and then there is a period until the end of February to send in further information, usually in direct response to questions that have been raised by ECOMOS. The recommendation of ICOMOS is sent to the nominating state party about six weeks prior to the World Heritage Committee session. And there is a, a short process to identify factual errors before the committee formally meets. The World Heritage Committee meets mid-year each year, and it is there when a decision for inscription will be taken. If the committee decides that more work is required before inscription can be can take place, it may uh, refer back or defer the nomination. So once a inscription occurs, there is much happy celebration by everyone, but, but the rest of forever begins. It's very important to remember that inscription is just the beginning of the commitments that are made to conserve the outstanding universal value of the nominated property. It's not an end. Um, and this is a gift to the world and to future generations made by the nominating country and by the local communities concerned. Thanks, Felicity. Thank you, Crystal, for that very comprehensive potted overview. It's a, a very long process. And I think um, it is good to acknowledge that it is just the, you know, the beginning um, of a process as well, um, the inscription. Um, so thank you so much for sharing your insights. 
Um, I'm now going to introduce our second panelist, um, Trevor Budge. Trevor Budge AM has worked for state and regional planning organisations, local government, RMIT and La Trobe universities, and conducted his own consulting business for 16 years. He currently works part-time as a strategic projects officer for the city of Greater Bendigo, focusing on world heritage listing for the central Victorian goldfields and supporting Bendigo's designation as a member of the UNESCO Creative Cities Network in the category of gastronomy. He has been working on world heritage recognition of the goldfields since the late 1980s when the concept was first advocated for by John Brumby when he was the federal member for Bendigo. Trevor, I might just get you to, to pop your camera on. Trevor, are you there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, Thanks. excellent. Thank you, thanks for joining us today. And thanks, I'm just gonna provide a little bit of context um, before we get started. Um, so the World Heritage Bid area for this um, nomination encompasses a massive 13 local government areas. So it's a very, a very large area and it's a big proposition. Um, I understand that the World Heritage approach for the Central Victorian goldfields has been modelled on the approach of the Cornwall West Devon mining landscape, which involved listing 10 distinct and highly significant areas to form what is known as a serial listing, which is when a series of individual sites from across a region are listed uh, to bring greater social and regional development benefits to the entire region. Can you explain how this approach has been managed in the context of the central Victorian goldfields? And what are some of the unique challenges that you've encountered? Thanks very much, Felicity. And uh, thanks to the National Trust for organising this event. And I too pay acknowledgement to the, the huge range of Indigenous groups who are represented in one way or another uh, by the bid and by the people who are here. Um, yes, you're right. The, the approach that we've taken is quite different to what perhaps people imagine. Um, people think of the central Victorian goldfields and you imagine that perhaps we're seeking to list the whole goldfields, which is an immense task in itself. And that was perhaps one of the original thoughts and ideas that people had. But working on the Cornwall West Devon model, which is now about 15 years old since they uh, joined the UNESCO World Heritage Listing, they took an approach where they had a similar region, which was vast and had a lot of ex outstanding examples of heritage, but they've done what's called a serial listing. And that is that they've taken um, key attributes of the region and used sites that are representative of the whole region. So if you can imagine how this might play out in the central Victorian goldfields, we've got literally hundreds of alluvial fields. We've got scores and scores of deep lead mining, quartz mining, and we've got so many representative examples of different uh, parts of the goldfields history, such as courthouses, schools, cemeteries, um, you know, engineering works and so on. And um, uh, it, it would be simply impossible to try and list them all. So what we're using is that same approach, a serial approach. What are the things that we can list as a world heritage, but uh, they would be representative of what we perhaps could call the best of the best. Um, and so choosing those is going to be extremely difficult. There are many people across the region who would um, dearly love um, a site or area that they uh, know and, and value to be so listed. So one of our biggest challenges actually is to, is to choose those sites, but also to perhaps tell the story that not every site can be listed, but nor does it mean that if a site isn't listed, it's of lesser significance. In fact, um, we've heard uh, particularly uh, Honourable John Brumby and Honourable Dennis Napthine talk about tourism. Tourists don't pick the eyes out of an area. They, they go to a region and they travel around and they like to see lots of examples of different things. 
Well, if we only have, say, 10 or 15 examples across the whole of central Victorian gold fields, and we're talking about a very large region, uh, it's, um, it's about 20, nearly 20% of the state, uh, people aren't just going to go to a, a dozen or so sites. They're going to be travelling through towns. They're going to be looking at other places, which in many cases might be more well-known than perhaps the World Heritage Sites because the World Heritage Sites may be quite small and but significant because they are the best example we've got of a particular activity associated with the heritage of the goldfields. So these are some of the real challenges we've got uh, of picking the sites that would represent that and explaining to people why those sites have been um, chosen. Um, I think it's important to realise that probably we're almost certainly going to be only talking about public land sites. Um, private sites are going to be extremely difficult. Um, one of the things is we must assure the management of the sites. So there's no point uh, choosing sites where we can't guarantee the management. So most of the sites that are likely to be uh, selected uh, will probably already have some form of protection. They've probably already been recognised by uh, local government planning schemes, they're listed in schemes, they may be on the State Heritage Register, the National Trust has already given some recognition to them as well. So uh, getting those sites uh, selected will be critical. The other thing is to line up all the different organisations and you know we've got the National Trust here but there are many organisations, there are lots of, there are scores of historical societies that are very, that uh, uh, you know, preciously guard their, their sites and their heritage. We've got lots of local organisations as well as the 13 councils, there are many government departments and agencies that are involved. So it's quite a complex process, as you can imagine. And Trevor, what's the approach to engage with the traditional owners as part of this process? Yeah, it's a really important point you raise here in this question. Um, we've actually got seven registered Aboriginal parties in the region, although um, one or two really occupy most of it. Um, quite a few are, are on the fringes of it. So we've got different registered Aboriginal parties, all at different stages of development. Um, for some of them, the gold fields are really important because they're the major underlying cultural landscape that they have that's been in, imposed by European invasion. For others, it might just be a, a peripheral area of a number of sites. So we've got different different approaches by um, uh, uh, different registered Aboriginal parties. One of the things that's been really useful is that Rodney Carter, who's the CEO of Jaja Rung, uh, is also the chair of the Aboriginal Heritage Council. And uh, we've been having extensive discussions uh, with a range of people to, first of all, determine what is the sort of response of um, Aboriginal people to this situation because in many ways uh, the gold fields and, and the gold rushes represent you know an, an extraordinary invasion of the area. Um, uh, Aboriginal people turn talk about the land being turned upside down uh, that in fact it's it's not just gold mining per se it's the whole impact on the landscape it's quite dramatic and um, I think for some people, they might think, well, this is really uh, a time where Aboriginal people may really um, resist, perhaps even wanting to recognise this period because of the disturbance, but more particularly because of the, the, the death and the disease that, that came with, with gold mining. However, what's, what's happened is as, as we uncover the layers and it's the cultural landscape that's so important, is that the Aboriginal story from going back 30, 40,000 years is also part of the story. Um, but more particularly, uh, recent study has indicated just what significant role Aboriginal people actually played in the gold rush itself. Um, now we've got a, we've, we're working with some historians and particularly um, at Federation University uh, where there's been quite a lot of work done on understanding what was the role of the Aboriginal community in the actual gold rushes themselves. And um, uh, we've been fortunate to be able to work with the Jar Jar Run particularly uh, to uh, do some further research around that. Um, we haven't got to the point where we can release that publicly, but I think what this is going to show, and it's based on some, um, some PhD work that's been done based on other research, 
that in fact the role of the Aboriginal community itself in actual gold rushes and in, this, and in, in mining themselves and in being involved um, in various elements of the gold rush over that period 1850 to 1900 was quite significant and it's perhaps been a story that's not been told extensively. So this, this becomes another layer of the story and it becomes another thing that we'll be putting forward to UNESCO and saying, here's, a, here's another element. And certainly we've heard from international experts that this is a very significant part of it because in many cases around the world, the Indigenous population had already had a long, long period of settlement before, the, before their gold rushes, whereas in the case of uh, the central Victorian region, the gold rushes happened within 20 years of the first um, European settlement. Fantastic, Trevor. Thank you so much um, for that enlightening discussion. And I'm sure that there'll be lots of questions um, to you after, afterwards as well. Um, so what I might do now is move to our third panelist. And Trevor, I'll just get you to turn your camera off um, for the moment. I would now like to welcome Professor Susan Lawrence. Professor Lawrence is an industrial archaeologist and environmental historian at La Trobe University, Melbourne. She has many years experience on sites all over Australia, including Tasmanian whaling stations, South Australian farms, and began work on the gold fields over 30 years ago. Susan and Peter Davis's recent book, Sludge, Disaster on the Gold Fields, which was shortlisted for the Prime Minister's Literary Awards, explores the troubling legacy of the gold rush, the environmental impact which the gold rush had on the region's lands and waterways, which still has consequences today. Thank you for joining us, Susan. So how do we balance these arguably negative consequences of the gold rush as we seek to recognise and celebrate the significance of the gold rush to Victoria and around the world? Well, thanks, Felicity. That's uh, a really good question. And thank you to the National Trust for hosting this event. Um, I acknowledge I'm on Wurundjeri Woiwurrung land in Melbourne, and I pay my respects to their um, elders past and present and to all the First Nations people who are uh, viewing this presentation. Um, first, uh, like many of the other speakers, I'm really passionate about the gold fields. I have worked there for a long time. I lived in Ballarat for a while. I love them. Um, I'm really confident that there is a case to be made that they do meet those outstanding universal values that um, that Crystal mentioned and that Trevor has been talking about as well. I think absolutely um, they do. Um, but I'm going to talk about the the negative side. And Trevor was talking a bit about the you know the Aboriginal um, what it meant for Aboriginal people when the gold rush happened. That's a really important thing to acknowledge that. Uh, much as I love the gold, gold fields and you know, all the, the positive things in that story, there are negatives. And it's important that they be remembered as well. And I don't think that that means that we can't still be proud of, of the accomplishments of um, during the gold rush. I don't think that that means that we don't still love these places. I think that it means um, that we have a more rounded understanding of these places and these events. And Dennis Knapfine referred to the way that um, the Budge BIM um, listing process and nomination really changed the understanding of that landscape and that history um, in southwestern Victoria. And I think that uh, the process is the same here in the central gold fields, that we still love them, but we understand them better. And I guess the, the negative impacts that I'm thinking about in particular, there are um, the impact on Aboriginal people that Trevor referred to, the importance of, of the invasion and the colonization that took place as a result of the gold fields and what that meant for Aboriginal people. So telling that story, um, but also you know, the Chinese who were such an important part of um, the mining and um, the community of Chinese people on the gold fields that arose. But the negative side of that was the racism that they experienced um, and the violence and things like the Bucklands riots up in northeastern Victoria, which were one of the most important racial riots um, in Australian history. That's part of the story of the gold fields as well. Um, and the story of um, the environmental damage that happened as a result of mining. And that's really where my research 
um, has most been in the last few years, things like land clearance and the way that all the forests and bushland was um, cut down and significantly changed. The, um, the bush areas that are still such a part of central Victoria are not you know, old growth native forests. They're very much regrowth forests um, because of um, the mining period. And then the, the work you alluded to in our book, Sludge, which is about the waste from mining that went into Victorian rivers and the impact that that had on Victorian waterways, which was devastating at the time. It was absolutely an industrial wasteland um, during the 19th century, that 50 year period of the industrial boom. But that has also had a lasting impact on Victorian rivers and the way the rivers operate and the way that we can use the floodplains. The other part of mining waste is the fact that a great deal of it was contaminated by all of the chemicals that are part of any kind of mining activity. Some of those chemicals are part of the background chemistry of, of central Victoria anyway, um, but some of them are things that were contributed that were added through mining and mercury would be the one um, that is best known to people. But you know um, that is what mining is about. Mining is about um, really high intensity industrial processes and it leaves waste and it leaves pollution. Some of it in the rivers, but some of it you know, was solid waste in the, the tailings piles and mullock heaps. And some of, of that material is still around and we need to be aware of that uh, just for um, our own personal safety. So I suppose I see the opportunities of this process as being very much about that process of education. So at that, as um, Dennis Knapfine mentioned, we have that changed understanding. We have the opportunity for people to hear about these stories, to learn about these stories. Often it is pretty new research that is shedding light on these. People haven't heard about it through their you know, schooling experience and so on. So this is a process to really make those stories um, more well known. Um, and it's also about helping people to connect to the places where they live, where they work, where they um, have their recreation, so they understand those places better and um, uh, what's gone into shaping them. And I suppose also the opportunity there to reflect on um, how things have changed since that period. I guess one of the things that the gold fields, the gold rush in Victoria did that was significant on a world stage is we it implement uh, legislation and controls to manage mining waste and mining pollution. And that was a huge achievement that we really should be proud of. But how do we reflect on you know, how we view these extractive activities today and um, our own role as consumers in um, benefiting from the, the products of those extractive activities and how we want to balance um, the environments that we love with the, the consumer um, goods and experiences in our lifestyle that we have. So thinking about those negative impacts from mining provides lots of opportunities for people to really um, have a richer experience and um, engagement with that Goldfields heritage. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, fascinating work and I really commend um, Sludge to everyone to read. It's a really fantastic book. Um, fantastic. So now I'd like to introduce you to our final speaker. Um, and this is really about how the World Heritage Listing pro process can have really fantastic benefits for community and community development. So um, I'm delighted to introduce you to Dr. Paul Rogers. With 20 years experience as a senior tourism advisor to national and local tourism organizations, Paul is one of Asia Pacific's most experienced tourism for development practitioners. Completed in 1997, his PhD centered on tourism, conservation and development issues in Nepal's Sagamatha Mount Everest National Park. Paul is a long-term expert consultant with the United Nations World Tourism Organization, the World Bank, and numerous other international organizations. He's the co-founder of Planet Happiness, a nonprofit measuring the happiness of residents living in world heritage sites and beyond. So recently, Paul, on the 20th of March, which was the International Day of Happiness, the World Heritage Bid Team and Planet Happiness launched the Happiness Index Survey, asking Goldfields residents to measure their happiness 
to assist with future tourism and economic planning for the region. The launch of this survey was a first in Australia, um, but has been utilised extensively overseas. How does the happiness index differ from other types of wellbeing measurement tools? And how can it assist in the bid process, but also the ongoing management of a World Heritage Site? Many thanks, uh, Felicity. Uh, hello, everybody. I would also like to uh, acknowledge uh, traditional landowners past and present, both uh, locally down there in the central Victorian gold fields and up here in northern New South Wales, where, where I uh, live. Um, in answering those questions, I'd like to uh, set the, the context and a, and a foundation, if, if I may, uh, by pointing out two things. For, firstly, when discussing happiness issues, we use three terms interchangeably. And so one of those is happiness, the second is well-being, and the third is, is quality of life. So for our purposes, these three terms all have the, the same meaning. And secondly, uh, I trust everybody here today would agree that it's the purpose of our government, whether it's local, state or national, to, to focus on improving the quality of our lives. After all, that's why we pay our taxes and why we vote. Now, coming back to uh, Felicity's question, to the best of my knowledge, the, the Happiness Index survey is the first and only uh, off-the-shelf peer-reviewed uh, survey instrument readily available to governments, communities uh, and businesses that provides a, a recognised, reliable and comprehensive measure of our individual community and, and destination well-being across 11 domains, uh, or rather 12 if we include tourism. The survey is based upon Bhutan's approach to measuring well-being, Bhutan being the small Himalayan kingdom widely acknowledged as the birthplace of gross national happiness or GNH, uh, that in 1972 prioritised happiness over gross domestic product, GDP, uh, and a reliance upon uh, economic metrics to measure uh, a nation's progress and development. Today, the, the happiness well, or well-being agenda is increasingly being taken up by enlightened and forward-looking governments around the world. Think New Zealand, uh, Iceland, uh, the UAE, and I should mention that all EU member states are involved in different types of happiness measurement and, and policy making. Now, I was hoping to show you some slides to help illustrate this, but we've had a, a technical issue, so I'm unable to, to do that. Now, in measuring happiness, Bhutan identified nine domains uh, and through a wider review of international practice, the happiness index embraces two additional domains. And by domains, we mean aspects of our lives that contribute to our well-being and quality of life. So the survey measures, for example, satisfaction with the quality of our local environments, our physical health and access to health services, our sense of community and standard of living. The extent to which uh, we also worry about money issues uh, or struggle to feed our families are uh, also embraced in the survey. And we have introduced a small number of questions on tourism. Do people think the level of visitation to their community is too high or too low or about right? Uh, does it provide jobs for local people and celebrate local culture? Now, uniquely and importantly, at the end of this online survey, each survey taker receives their own scorecard, providing a snapshot of their own well-being. The scorecards help illustrate how this term well-being is defined and how our well-being can be measured. They also spark conversations and thoughts about the highs and lows of our scores and what might be done to strengthen the domains where we score quite low or lowest on our, you know, on our personal scorecards. Now, I think we can all appreciate that tourism is a vehicle for development. It acts as an engine of change associated with income generation and job creation, as well as a range of social and environmental impacts. And while many of these benefits may be positive, tourism will always be a double-edged sword, bringing negative impacts as well. And different people will have different views as to the value and overall benefits that tourism is bringing to our communities. 
Now this is important because world heritage status is generally associated with a growth in tourism development and local visitation. And institutions assessing the, the World Heritage bid and responsible for monitoring and managing the site over time will want to see how tourism is impacting the site. Uh, for example, what steps are being taken to measure and ensure the development of tourism is benefiting local residents and communities and their environment, and to what extent are local communities being consulted and involved in its development and in encouraged to participate in that development. Now, over the last 20 years, I've supported more, uh, I've supported the development of more tourism development plans than I can care to remember. And while this is a a complex process, it's also quite straightforward in that you engage with all different arms of government and the tourism private sector, not just the tourism department, but transport, culture, environment, uh, then there are the, the education and training for the industry and of course finance from government needs to uh, come in. And similarly, we engage with the private sector by talking largely through the associations, the hotels or tour operators, uh, the restaurants or chambers of commerce, but trying to reach out to the host communities and engage them in tourism conversations is less straightforward and more complex. And so this is why, or this is rather the gap that our process with Planet Happiness is, is focused upon. Because just as we have these individual scorecards that show our well-being compared to all other survey taker, we can generate individual scorecards for sites, for postcards, and we can stack the, the scores across the 11 domains. I was hoping to illustrate this for you. So we can see where the host community is strongest with their, with their strengths, their destination well-being, their community well-being, and we can see where the deficient scores are. And we can use those one-page scorecards to generate conversations and ask the community to propose policies or interventions that could help strengthen uh, destination well-being. So you, through the use of these scorecards and uh, wider reports that are geared towards uh, engaging host communities, we can focus the conversations of all stakeholders, the businesses, the governments, the communities, the visitors on what can be done to strengthen the quality of life of host communities. So um, that, I hope that answers the, the two questions for you there, Felicity. Absolutely. Thank you, Paul. Um, it's a really fascinating process and um, we invite Goldfields um, residents and people who work in the Goldfields to get involved in the Happiness Index survey and we'll provide a link to that at the end of this session. Um, but now I'd like to invite um, our panellists, Crystal, Crystal, Trevor and Susan, um, to switch their cameras on um, and we will go to a Q&A session and I'd like to invite our audience to um, um, pop any questions that you might have into the Q&A section. We've already got a few coming through. Um, so over the next 10 minutes, we'll try and get through um, as many as we can. Okay, so first question, and I think that um, this could be directed to Trevor, um, but feel free um, for anyone else to, to step in. This question's from Ken McInnes, um, and Ken asks, Given that the gold fields, particularly the deep leads, interacts with the Western volcanics, isn't it worthwhile reinscribing the Kanawinka Geopark in a parallel process to the gold fields World Heritage nomination? Trevor, you're just on mute. Yeah, it's a it's a really interesting uh, point that's made in the question. Uh, I think this is we're actually. Um, the more work we do, the more research we have, the more information that comes to hand, the more we realise the interconnectedness of a whole range of things. And Dennis Napthine talked about the Budge BIM bid. Uh, this has, I think, uh, enlightened us in terms of uh, the way in which we approach Indigenous heritage. Uh, the, the actual volcanic landscapes of Western Victoria are... Uh, uh, is not entirely embraced by the central Victorian goldfields, but a large part of it is. And we know that that's one of the most significant 
uh, volcanic landscapes in the world. I think it's the third largest in the world. And uh, it has particular interest uh, for Indigenous people, uh, particularly as we understand it's highly likely that some of those volcanoes were actually active at the time uh, of early settlement by um, uh, Aboriginal people. So this becomes part of the part of the uh, reality and mythology around the region. Um, so uh, we're very open to the idea that other people may be inspired to take on other uh, listings or other recognitions. Uh, obviously, we've, we're focusing at the moment on World Heritage Listing for Central Victorian Goldfields, but we think it, it's strengthened by a number of other attributes. We're also mindful of the fact that uh, both Bendigo and Ballarat have recently joined the UNESCO Creative Cities Network, um, Bendigo in category of gastronomy and Ballarat in craft and folk art. I think that adds also to the whole concept that there's something unique about this whole area and we'd welcome other people who may have initiatives uh, like the questioner has raised. Thank you, Trevor. Okay, I've got a, a question about tourism, so I might direct this to Paul. This is from uh, Warwick Frost, who is Professor of Tourism and Heritage at La Trobe University. What is the relationship between World Heritage Listing and increased tourism? And are there good international examples regarding cultural heritage sites? Thanks, Felicity and, uh, and uh, Warwick. Um, it, well, glo globally, it is, it is recognised that once a, a site is designated, uh, given the World Heritage status, then visitation increases. Uh, particularly for international visitors, uh, when they go to a country, they want to see the, the cream, uh, the best examples of natural and cultural heritage, and that is generally uh, world heritage sites. Think of the, the Barrier Reef, for example, a natural world heritage site. Uh, globally, there are 1,100 uh, and 21 uh, world heritage sites, and of those, uh, 869 are, are cultural heritage sites. So, um, you know, globally there are uh, a, a wide variety and diversity of cultural heritage sites, many of them well, obviously historic, um, and there are many lessons that can be taken from those sites around the world um, that uh, can be of benefit to the, the central Victorian goldfields. And if I could just put in a, a quick plug actually, um, an initiative called Our World Heritage was recently launched um, and in the launch of that program they had a competition for information technology projects to support world heritage objectives and our planet happiness approach in partnership with Nepal's Mount Everest National Park we came second in that competition they recognized the value of our approach in supporting world heritage processes and engaging communities in that in that process and getting the best out of the tourism sector thank you great thanks Paul okay I've got a question now for Crystal uh, and this is a question that I'm sure that many people have um, and one which is probably quite difficult to answer. Um, but the question is um, from Marie Watt, who asks, assuming a best case scenario, what is the estimated time frame to ultimate listing? Oh, it's such a good question. Thanks for asking. And uh, it can be quite long. And uh, some of Australia's World Heritage uh, properties have had a period of, you know, 20 plus years of working on their World Heritage nominations. Others have been much faster. Um, we would normally expect there to be at least a um, three to five year period to get all the evidence together, all the different uh, stakeholders in agreement uh, and uh, all the, the various management plans and so on to be drafted and, and really road tested. Um, so, but it depends on where you think we, we are in that process already, as John Brumby mentioned at the beginning of the session, we've been talking about this for 30 years already. So um, I, I, I think from ICOMOS's point of view and the World Heritage Committee, we really don't like to see rushed nominations that have 
to, you know, paste it over too many things that aren't quite um, resolved yet. And yet there's no reason to stretch it out forever and ever and lose momentum and the very benefits that uh, many speakers have mentioned. So it's very much the length of a piece of string. Um, move, move forward quickly and, uh, and, uh, and, and steadily and uh, submit the nomination when it's ready. Thanks. Could I just add uh, the timetable that we're working to at the moment, Felicity would say the earliest possible would be mid-2025, uh, but as Crystal notes, uh, it can certainly... Thank you. Um, so I, I have a question now for Susan um, from an anonymous attendee. Susan, your work shows that water and water distribution systems and structures were vital in mining and settlement history, but these are under serious threat from bikes and other new land uses. How can that heritage be protected before the evidence is all lost, as has already occurred in many goldfields areas? And Trevor, you might want to jump in on this one as well. Yeah, thank you. That's a good question. Um, threats to heritage are always there from lots of different dimensions, things that might be new like cycling, but also old things like mining legislation. I noticed this morning there's a new um, exploration license that has just been applied for over a large area near Creswick. Um, so how the world heritage process or any of our heritage processes protect those sites and those landscapes is a really important question um, to think about. Partly it's how the fabric is protected, partly it's about how those values that Crystal referred to are protected. What is, what is it about these places that we do value and what makes them significant? How do we protect that? And sometimes it's possible to have um, what we call adaptive reuse where um, the values are still protected of what we, we want to keep, but the way that that place has, has, is being used has changed. And that doesn't have to be a negative thing. Um, I've been to the, the Cornwall and West Devon World Heritage Site um, and many of the places in that massive big listing. And, you know, unless you're a World Heritage geek like me, you wouldn't know that it was a World Heritage site. They look like normal towns, they look like normal countryside, um, stuff still happens there and goes on there. So World Heritage is not about locking it up and keeping things in a, you know, a, a crystalline um, moment from the 1850s or even from now. There's still uses that will happen in these places going forward. I think that's a really important point. Um, from day one, we've said this is not. Sorry, Trevor, you just jumped in a little bit. Sorry, Trevor, we've lost your audio. I'll score for gold. Um, this is not a stopping that activity. It is about making sure that we preserve what's really important. And one of the significant things we have, for instance, we have the Castlemaine um, diggings, which has got a national heritage park status. So getting the status right on these areas and making sure the preservation is right, as I indicated, this will almost certainly just encompass a number of public land sites, most of which have already got some form of protection, either through the local council planning scheme, they're on, they're on an Australian or Victorian Heritage Register. Um, they've got local groups who, who manage and government departments and agencies who manage. So it is, it's a complex issue and it's, it's going to be challenging, but um, we recognise that continuing use uh, is important um, because it really does tell a story. This is, this is about something that's not going away. Gold mining is not going away. Great, well, I think that is an excellent um, note to end on. And I just wanna uh, thank all of our panelists today um, for joining us and exploring this rich topic in such a short period of time. Uh, we really appreciate your time and so offer you a virtual round of applause as I'm sure our audience does as well. 
So I might get you all to turn your cameras off now while I just share some links um, for people who would like to see some further information about what we've talked about today. So you can visit any of these links to find out more information. And thank you again for joining us today. We really appreciate your attendance.